Hello, this is Ed Chapman, and this video cast is going to focus on basic organic chemistry, or how do we get such a huge diversity of organic molecules from a relatively small number of simple monomers. The first idea I want to talk about today is the idea of carbon as a backbone atom. Um, it's the central idea to organic chemistry in that you can combine carbons into chains, rings, and all sorts of combinations of these to produce a vast number of organic compounds. Um, organic compounds all contain carbon, and they start out with very small things like methane up to very huge, very large molecules like proteins and DNA. Uh, remember from biology that all living things are con controlled or composed mainly of a relatively small set of atoms, of course carbon being the one we're going to talk about today, also hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. So this little acronym is a good one to remember. Also, living cells take small building blocks or smaller organic building blocks like simple sugars, nucleic acids, nucleotides, and put them together to build very large chains or things that we call polymers. This is a basic idea to biology. Before 1953, most scientists, most um, chemists believed that organic molecules can only be produced inside of living cells. For example, if you wanted to get DNA, or if you wanted to build sugars, or if you wanted to build proteins, all these things had to take place. All this um, production had to take place inside of a living cell. And in 1953, a very, very important landmark experiment showed that this isn't necessarily true. If you take a chamber, of water and you boil it and you capture this steam and you pipe it into another chamber where you have added some basic um, components, compounds like methane, ammonia, hydrogen gas, and of course the water vapor that you're making. And if you treat this to, if you, if you shock this with electrical sparks, um, something akin to lightning, and you condense this gas and run it back through and do this over and over again. Let this setup run for a few days and then take a sample down here and you check this, this precipitate, this material that's coming out down here, you're gonna find organic molecules. And when Miller did this experiment in 1953, he found simple amino acids and simple sugars down here in this um, collection jar. So he showed that you can build organic molecules abiotically or outside of living cells. The next concept I want to touch on today is why carbon does what it does. And we have to go into a little bit of chemistry here. If you remember, carbon is number six on the periodic table, which means carbon has six protons and six electrons. So if we go ahead and map them out here, there's two in the innermost energy level, and then surrounding that are the final four. Okay, and if you remember, um, there is stability when you have eight electrons in your outermost energy level, or what we call eight, um, the octet, or the, um, the rule of eight here. So we have four vacancies here. So this means carbon, as an atom, wants to form four covalent bonds to complete its octet and to fill its valence up with eight electrons. So that means carbon atoms will always form four covalent bonds. Okay, so carbon atoms in chemistry seek to form four covalent bonds, and you can represent these covalent bonds with little lines like this. So we can build some basic organic molecules here using this rule. So if you take a carbon atom and you bond to it four hydrogens or four protons, what you end up with is the simplest organic molecule possible, which is CH4, known as methane. All right, and if you take two carbons, hook them to each other, and you fill them up or saturate them with hydrogens, okay, you end up with the next most simple organic molecule, which is CH3, CH3. You can also write it as C2H6. And this coarse chemical is known as ethane. Uh, both of these are flammable natural gases. So what you need to see, what's important to realize here, is that each carbon atom is forming 
one, two, three, oops, one, two, three, four covalent bonds. One, two, three, four. And this carbon has one, two, three, four. You can see that's the rule. So you can always check these diagrams to make sure they're right if you, if you see that each carbon has four and only four bonds to it. Now, you can also do double bonding. So a carbon can be double bound to another carbon, and then you fill it up with hydrogens. And remember the rule of four here. So each carbon now has one, two, three, four. So this carbon's valence is filled, and this one has one, two, three, four. So this one's filled. So this molecule here is C2H4, and we call that ethene. We change the, the name of it to an E here. But again, this is just carbon held together by two double bonds. You can also do triple bonds and, and all sorts of variations of carbon numbers and things. But what I want you to see is that carbon can form massively long, complicated chains. All right? You can do anything you want here. You can even hook carbons together into rings. I mean, the, the possibilities are almost endless here. So that's the idea of carbon as a backbone. Okay, The idea of carbon as a backbone molecule It's central to organic chemistry. The last thing I want to talk about is some chemical groups that you need to know. Uh, chemical groups are things that are added to carbon chains that change the properties and of course change the name of the chemical. And there's a set of these you guys need to be familiar with. Um, there is something called a hydroxyl group, a carbonyl group, carboxyl groups, amino groups, sulfhydryl groups, phosphate groups, and methyl groups. And if you know something about these, uh, the rest of the year in AP Biology is going to be a little bit easier because all of these chemical groups change the properties of organic compounds, and they're very important to the chemistry of life. So let's take each one of these in turn, and we'll talk about them. Okay, our first functional group is the hydroxyl group, which if we take a really simple carbon compound here, all right, so I'm going to just do a real simple ethane here, just like we had before. But instead of a hydrogen here, I'm going to add a hydroxyl group. Hydroxyl groups are an oxygen bound to a hydrogen. So actually, it's O hooked to H like this. And this is what's attached to this molecule. And we no longer call this ethane. This is now something we call ethanol. And you may remember ethanol is an alcohol. So whenever you see a hydroxyl group on an organic molecule, it's an alcohol. So that's the simplest. Okay, let's do another one. Let's do a carbonyl group. Okay, what does a carbonyl group look like? A carbonyl group is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. All right, so if we put this into the center of a three carbon molecule here, okay, this is, this is um, a propane back, uh, backbone here. So all these, of course, are saturated with hydrogens. Okay, checking myself here. Notice we can't put a hydrogen here because one, two, three, four, this carbon's valence is filled. So now we have a carbon backbone, normal, so it would CH3 and a CH3 at the end, but in the middle we have a CO, okay, a C double bonded to an oxygen. This forms a chemical called acetone, okay, and acetones exist because the carbon backbone has a double bond in the middle. If you put it on the end, it's something different, but I'm going to skip over that for right now. Okay, our next functional group is our carboxyl group. Happens to be my favorite. I like to say carboxyl. It makes you sound smart when you say carboxyl. If we take a ethane backbone, okay, do a CH3 as we had before, and here on this second carbon, we add a double bonded oxygen and a hydrogen. Okay, this is what we call a carboxyl group. So a carboxyl group is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and double and a single bond. I'm sorry, to an OH. I'm in an OH here. So this whole thing is a carboxyl group. 
and carboxyl groups produce acids. So what I've just drawn here is an organic acid called acetic acid. It happens to be the acid in vinegar, all right? Because what happens is when you mix this with water, this hydrogen right here can disassociate and form our friend hydrogen ions, which of course lower pH, so it makes this an acid. So carboxyl groups form carboxylic acids. Uh, for example, acetic acid. Look for the carboxyl group. When you see these, you know you have an acid. All right, our next group is an amino group, which is incredibly important. You probably remember amino acids. Okay, an amino group. An amino group looks like this. It's a nitrogen, double bonded, excuse me, single bond here, and two hydrogens. All right, so if you hook one of these to a carbon skeleton, you get an amine, all right? And let's do an example here. Let's draw a very simple amine, or, or what we might call an amino acid, like glycine, okay? Glycine is one of the 20 amino acids that um, proteins are built out of. So let's build a glycine. We have a carbon hooked to a carbon, and we're here we're going to add our amine group. So amine group, okay? And because glycine is an amino acid, we have to add to the other end of it this type of arrangement. Do you guys remember what this is? Okay, so this group right here is a carboxylic or carboxyl group. And this right here is our amine. Okay, so our functional group that we're talking about using glycine as an example is an amino group. And, well, I'll actually change this to an amino. So remember, carboxyls produce acids. So this is a very simple amino acid. You can always tell an amino acid because it's got this NCC or CCN structure. And you've got an amine group at one end and a carboxyl group at the other. And to finish this off, we have to saturate this carbon here with the hydrogen. So this is one of the simplest amino acids you can get called glycine. Uh, you make different amino acids by taking off one of these hydrogen and hooking something else there. And it could be a whole variety of things, but that's how you build different amino acids. All right, our next functional group is a sulfhydryl group. Sulfhydryl, okay, and this chemical group looks like this. It's a sulfur and a hydrogen bound to whatever it is you want to attach it to. So let's build a real simple sulfhydryl containing molecule. Um, the one the book uses is this structure. Looks to me, yep, it's another amino acid. Um, so here we've got our amine group at this end. The central carbon has a hydrogen attached to it and another carbon with two hydrogens like this. And finally, hanging off the end of it here is the SH. That's our sulfhydryl group right there. That's what we're talking about. And to finish this off, remember to finish an amino acid, you have to have a carboxyl group. So I'll add double bonded O, OH at this end. And let me check myself here. Yes, I'm, I've successfully drawn a cysteine or cystine. This is another amino acid uh, used to build proteins. All right, so it's an amino acid because it's got the carboxyl group down here. We've got the amine group here, and we've added on a third functional group or a third chemical group here, a sulfhydryl group down here. So cysteine or cystine is one of the amino acids that contains the element sulfur. That's going to be important when we start talking about the structure of proteins in the future. All right, our next functional group is the phosphate group. And heard about this before, you may not remember, but phosphate groups are, remember, ATP, triphosphate. Well, the P in ATP refers to the phosphate group. Phosphate groups look like this. They're an oxygen hooked to a phosphorus, double bonded to an oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. And this oxygen down here, has a, these two here have open bonds, so they, they're negative. So this is a if you hook this with this bond right here to something, you phosphorylate it. So 
Frequently in biology, you're going to be, or AP biology, you're going to be hearing about things being phosphorylated. All that means is you're adding a phosphate group to it. I'm not going to draw an example here because it's kind of a big one. But phosphate groups are oxygen, 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 oxygen with a phosphorus in the middle. And the second bond of this oxygen is attached to this something over here. It could be, you know, whatever you want it to be. But when you attach it, you phosphorylate it. And finally, our last functional group is a methyl group. Okay, when you add methyl groups to things, you methylate them. All right, a methyl group is simply a carbon with three hydrogens. Remember, if it's got a hydrogen here, it's just methane. But if you take this hydrogen off and hook this whole thing to something, so imagine you have a big piece of DNA. Okay, and DNA, of course, is made up of nucleotides. And to one of these nucleotides, you hook a CH3 or a methane, a methyl group, you what we call you methylate the DNA. And when DNA gets methylated, it can't be read, it can't be expressed, it's, it's literally switched off permanently. So that's something we're going to be talking about a little later too. So all together, let me get rid of this. If we go back, you should know something about all of these chemical groups. And just a quick review here. Okay, hydroxyl groups produce alcohols, carbonyl groups can produce things like acetone, uh, carboxyl groups produce acids, amino groups associated with amino acids. Okay, just a quick list of things to remember here. Sulfhydryl groups are, they have a sulfur in them. Phosphate groups, phosphorylation. Boy, I butchered that spelling, but you get the idea. And finally, methyl groups, when you add them, you methylate things. So we can call that methylation. So a basic understanding of this chemistry is going to help you a lot in when we talk about photosynthesis and respiration and all those things later on in, in um, AP Biology. Thank you, and that ends our slideshow.